Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Alona Sidika, and I'm your host this evening. Um, we have a packed pro program for the next hour. So before we get started, um, let me run through some of the interactive features that um, we, we have available tonight. So first off, our investment consultants are live. Um, so you can find them um, on our website through the web chat. You can also go on your MoneyFarm app and speak with them there. And you can use Facebook Messenger to reach out to them. Um, and you can sort of ask them any questions about the, the, the program today or about your portfolio, about your investments, anything. Um, and also I was encouraged to book an appointment as well so you can chat with them afterwards. Um, we also have a Q&A function enabled. So on your Zoom, you will see the Q&A option. So feel free to use it for, for questions. We have Richard's team manning it today. So do ask questions about portfolios. Um, and if we don't answer your question, please don't worry. Um, we will get back to you in the next few days. We also have an event hashtag, which is MFM21. And you can tweet us, you can use it. We will be using it throughout the evening. So do join the discussion, tweet your favorite moments, quotes, um, or screen share. So feel free to have, have some of the social media fun that we're going to. Um, and then finally, the event is recorded. So we will share a link with you after the event, probably tomorrow, um, with, the, with the recording of the event and also the strategic asset allocation document. So you can review um, what Richard is going to be talking about in more detail. Now over to, to the speakers. As you can see on the screen, we have Richard Flax, um, Chief Investment Officer, talking about the investment strategy. Um, and Ross Godlinton, Head of Product, who will talk about the evolution of our customer experience. But to, to get us all started, um, Giovanni Datra, um, our co-founder and chief executive, will, um, will introduce the event and um, tell you a little bit more about the business and where we're at. So uh, Giovanni, over to you. Very, hello, everybody, and, uh, and thanks for, uh, for coming to the event. Uh, we have now have, uh, uh, I would say more than 400 people joining. So definitely uh, it's, it's great to have you here and it's great for you to find the time to, to listen to us for, uh, for 50 minutes. We'll, uh, we'll try to make it as relevant as possible and uh, give you a bit of insight in uh, what has been our uh, decision and our story for the last uh, uh, 12 to 18 months and what happened uh, on the back of 2020, which has been a, definitely uh, an important and, and complicated year for, for all of us. Uh, so first of all, to give you some insight about our business, how we're doing, uh, and uh, and uh, and since we we manage uh, uh, hopefully a big chunk of your money, we, we do really believe that it's important that you understand also uh, how we're doing as a business. So the um, last year for us has been actually uh, quite positive, and uh, and uh, we managed to uh, significantly grow uh, our. Uh, our business, uh, notwithstanding the, the complicated situation we faced. In particular, we, we had uh, uh, almost uh, double our revenue uh, and, uh, and uh, increase uh, over 40% our asset under management, uh, which is the money we manage for the, for the customer to just slightly over 1.3 billion uh, pound. Uh, we believe that the, the work we've been doing in, uh, in simplifying and, uh, and really focusing on uh, what we do best, which is uh, manage and support uh, uh, you and everybody in, uh, in their investment, particularly with reference to uh, diversified discussionary portfolio, is one of the things that uh, is kind of uh, had led us to, to continue to grow the business and achieve, uh, uh, we hope, a uh, high, uh, high amount of customer satisfaction. Um, this year was uh, was very very strange also from the market perspective and uh, and if you if you if you remember um, what happened is that the risky asset fell very very sharply in March and uh, and I remember we sat down with Richard which uh, you you're gonna hear talking very very soon and of course we had to take some complicated decision uh, you know how to manage the portfolio around that time and it was quite a a first for everybody. Uh, and I, and I do have to say that the experience of Richard and the team 
that uh, although they haven't seen a pandemic before, as probably uh, none of us did, uh, the reality is that uh, by focusing on the long term and focusing on on the on the our our strong belief that time is one of the key uh, driver of long term success and uh, and a very and a big ally for a, a cautious investor, uh, we acted very conservatively on the portfolio. Uh, maybe uh, foregoing some of the upside, but uh, managing the risk of the portfolio uh, in a way that uh, I think uh, we were very, very happy to. Uh, and I do remember specifically in March, we, we had uh, three investment committee uh, uh, that uh, pretty much uh, uh, were uh, trying to understand uh, uh, how the pandemic could look like. And I think that uh, we didn't probably imagine that the recovery could have been that swift, particularly in the market, as you as you probably are aware. It was one of the shortest uh, bear time uh, bear market in history, uh, but we did uh, realize that uh, regardless of how long it would have taken, this uh, uh, would have been uh, over uh, sooner or later. And I think that was kind of the one of the core belief that led us to. Uh, originally decreased some of the equity exposure, but very, very uh, pretty much kept the portfolio intact without rushing to, uh, to let's say, harsh decision on reducing uh, too much risk, uh, which uh, some of our competitors also did. Uh, so I think we came out of 2020 uh, in, a, in a positive uh, mood. And I think that we are actually starting 2021 with a more positive attitude towards the market uh, versus where we were in 2019. And I think Richard is going to talk uh, to you a bit more about that. But also as a business, uh, we're more and more convinced that uh, our way of helping and supporting through our investment consultant, through our content, uh, and uh, uh, employing as much resources as possible to improve the experience on the platform, it's really what uh, uh, what is driving uh, uh, adoption and what I believe uh, uh, makes uh, Money Farm uh, a very strong uh, experience and product and solution for the, for for all of you. Uh, just another anecdotal evidence of what happened in 2020. I mean, we really did invest a lot in trying to stay as close as possible to to all of you. We had almost uh, 10,000 conversations with our advisor, uh, 50. 55,000 hours uh, of, uh, of uh, videos on our YouTube channels, uh, 3 million visitors to the website uh, of, of, of our property globally, of, of which 1.5 million to the blog. So the, the effort we did in trying to help you remain invested, which we thought it was the best thing to do, and it turned out to be the best thing to do, uh, was really one of the uh, I think big uh, big achievement of which I'm very proud of all the team and the organization how we did it in 2020. Um, I have to say that if I have to draw a couple of conclusions before I leave the the the, uh, the conversation to Richard and Ross is that what did we learn in 2020? I think as a business uh, uh, and a, and as a company as a as an asset manager, I think that. We learned that the, the guardrails of our process worked. So I think we, we managed to stick to our way of managing money and making decisions, even in the con, in, in, I would think is one of the most uncertain period ever for all of us, not only personal, but as a business, as a, as a investor. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm quite proud of the role uh, that Richard played and the experience that they brought to the table in order to, to facilitate that. We also, uh, I think, really learned that, that market timing doesn't work, and I really struggled to 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 see or uh, to hear anybody that could have predicted how fast the market would have come back uh, from the bottom of the 23rd of March. And I think uh, this resonates and uh, it keep on confirming our view that uh, trying to time the market uh, is borderline impossible. Uh, and that's why you need to take a different approach to be able to have long-term success. And we also learn again that cash, as much as sometimes feels like the, the, the right place to be in the face of all uncertainty that we live, uh, it's generally speaking the, the least secure of our asset. Uh, and I think this is really, really important also uh, in consideration of what we expect to be 
uh, uh, a period with most likely slightly higher inflation and uh, which could have an impact on, on, uh, on uh, your uh, real value of your cash. So as a business, this was kind of the, 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 the learning and, and, uh, and the fact that we were a, a digital business allow us to operate seamlessly uh, during this period. And I do really hope that you have valued the, the, the work that we have done in 2020. Uh, and then we can continue to improve uh, and uh, uh, improve the experience, the platform, the services, and uh, generally speaking, our awareness uh, in the UK. So with that, Ilona, if you want to uh, step in, I will leave the, 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 the talk to uh, Richard and uh, Ross. Thank you, Giovanni. For everyone who just joined, first of all, thank you for all the, all the questions. Um, to answer some of them, yes, the event is, is being recorded. Um, and we will also share um, the link with you afterwards and the, the full strategic asset allocation document. Um, and consultants are live, so do, do ask them questions um, in the Q&A here, but also on our website, in-app and on Facebook Messenger. Finally, social media, we're there, so if you want to get involved, do so. Um, but now over to, to Richard Flax, um, Chief Investment Officer, to, to present the highlights of, of the strategy this year. Over to you, Richard. Thank you very much indeed, Elona. Uh, let me just share this very quickly. Um, Great. Um, so hopefully uh, you, you see the presentation. I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes. Um, and obviously the, the, the Q&A is, is, is very welcome. Uh, we'll try and get as many of them as we can. Um, uh, so uh, just to start on the agenda, um, we will touch on um, last year. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, performance of markets. Um, we'll come to some conclusions or, or, or try to on or considerations um, of uh, what we learned last year and try and think about some of the longer term implications uh, that there may be. Um, we'll touch on the briefly on the investment process just to put the uh, our strategic asset allocation um, into into a broader context. And then we'll turn to that and turn to some of the conclusions that we reached. Um, and then we'll, we'll um, chat a little bit about, about 2021, um, how we see things developing, um, some of the opportunities, some of the risks, and then we'll make some, I'll make some, concluding, some concluding remarks. Um, so let's dive straight in. Um, so what we have here is, is really just a, um, a set of different asset classes um, and their returns um, each calendar year for the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, and 2020 stands out, not necessarily in the headline, um, where actually the headline numbers were pretty good, but actually in terms of the range of outcomes. Uh, I would draw your attention to a couple of examples. At the bottom, you see that the, um, the spread between uh, the uh, IT sector globally uh, and the energy sector was around 72%, um, which was one of the biggest spreads that we've seen um, over, the last, over the last decade. Um, at a country level, um, within developed markets, the spread between the US and the UK, for instance, was very large. Uh, in emerging markets uh, between Latin America and Asia, the spread again was, was, was very big. Um, and so what you saw was this, this, this very wide range of outcomes, um, particularly in the equity markets, um, that really drove some of the, um, you know, the outsized performance, both positive and negative, that we saw in parts of, uh, in parts of, of the market in, in the course of last year. Um, Giovanni alluded to this before, but this is this chart tries to, 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 to capture the point. Um, the recovery um, from the 30% decline, and, and we use the S&P 500 in the US here just uh, to make the comparison easier. Um, this was the fastest recovery uh, that we saw from a 30% decline uh, in the equity market over the last um, six episodes. Um, really very, very quick indeed. Um, and and you know, it's certainly to us, at least surprisingly so. Um, but it speaks to the challenges of, of, um, of, of, of managing portfolios and, and, and coming to decisions in, in the context of, um, you know, very unusual environment, certainly not one that, that, that we had seen before uh, with regards to the pandemic, but also speaking to the, um, to the extraordinary level of policy support that we saw um, and the speed of that support. Um, and in some ways, what you saw perhaps were, were some of the learnings from the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, particularly on the monetary policy side. 
um, but also on this occasion on the fiscal policy side where you saw you know governments making decisions and, and developing new product uh, new policies really extremely quickly um, far faster than they would, would would normally expect to do and then the other part um, to, 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 to highlight here one perhaps that, that, that we know but somehow doesn't get enough of enough play is, is a very optimistic outlook from, from, from equity markets in particular about how quickly the healthcare complex was going to be able to respond to the pandemic and to come up with a, with a vaccine. It gets mentioned you know, regularly, perhaps not regularly enough, just how remarkable it was to be able to produce a functioning vaccine um, or set of vaccines within, within a year, um, given that history suggested that it was a multi -year, typically a multi-year uh, undertaking. Um, and yet somehow equity markets remarkably were, were, you know, came to that conclusion relatively quickly, at least based on this recovery, at least that's, that's our interpretation. Um, and you saw this very, very fast recovery. Um, so now let's turn to, to, to a couple of, um, to some, some considerations as we think going forward. Uh, consideration one is that, that, you know, market valuations, as you may have seen, are, are above long-term averages. Um, frequently get, that gets talked about in the context of the equity market and particularly in terms of parts of the US equity market. But really we should, we should start by thinking about the left-hand chart, which is, which is the bond market. And, and government bond yields, as, as, as you know, are extremely low or negative uh, in, in, in a number of parts of the world. Um, that has some implications for, um, for portfolio construction. It has some of the implications that, uh, for, um, you know, for the appeal of government bonds. Um, but it's important to highlight that when we think about, about valuations and we think about when we talk about valuations that are above average, um, we should really start by thinking about the government bond valuation and the, you know, the, the level of, of, of interest rates. On the right-hand side, you have, you have a similar chart on, on forward price earnings ratios for a range of equity markets, and it's the U.S. equity market that stands out. Um, Partly because of its composition, because of the, the you know the, the the technology complex and the you know the success that that, that has had, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, but there is this um, this somehow a bifurcation between um, particularly the growth parts of the uh, of the global equity market and 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 and, and perhaps value um, that's worth exploring. So when we think about questions about uh, our markets overvalued, it's important to to, to see the the differentiation. Um, that we saw not just in the performance of 2020, but actually in terms of what seems to be implied by equity markets or different parts of the equity market as we go into 2021 and beyond. Um, the second consideration, which I've mentioned already, is around policy support. Um, as I said, governments were very, very quick, um, government broadly defined was very, very quick to act. Um, so what you see here is, is the blue lines are looking back at the amount of, of, of fiscal support in the uh, financial crisis, 2008 to 2010, and compared to where we are now, where we were in 2020. And obviously you see in most parts of the world, all parts of the world, um, the gap is very meaningful. The, the support provided in 2019 to 2020, according to, uh, to the IMF, was, was far higher than was the case you know, more than a decade ago. Um, and the, the, the diamonds speak to the increase of, of central bank assets. Um, and you've seen a, a, a meaningful increase there, um, 30 to, 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 you know, 50, 60, and even more in terms of percentage growth. And that speaks to the extent to which, you know, what we have generally thought of as fiscal and monetary policy have somehow been acting in concert. That governments have issued debt, and broadly speaking, whatever they may say, central banks have been buying that debt. Um, and the, um, the short-term implications have been able to, to support the, uh, the economy and the financial system. Uh, the longer-term implications are, are you know, still to be understood. Uh, it's something that we'll come back to in a bit more detail. Um, the next chart here talks really about um, economic growth distribution, and, and, and that's, that's really code for you know, the rise of China. Um, what you see at the, um, you know, the bottom the bottom part of the chart is, is you see the extent to which China's, China's share of world GDP has grown dramatically since, uh, you know, since the, uh, the mid-90s um, and, and, and continues to do so. 
Um, and that also speaks to the, the relative speed with which China appears to have recovered um, from the economic shock of, of the pandemic in 2020. I will show you a little bit more um, current data on that. But it's a theme that we think is going to continue um, in the coming years. Um, that has implications uh, not just for, for Chinese assets, but also for geopolitics and the relationship particularly between the US and China. Um, that will potentially be a, a meaningful driver of, of, uh, of the global economy and global politics going forward. Um, I won't spend too long on this. We I made the point before. It just it, the, the charts, particularly in the US, you know, captures the spread between the best and the worst sector. Um, I would draw your attention to the to the gray lines at the bottom, the gray bars. Uh, what you see is that in the US, the, the, the spread was very, very big, certainly relative to history. Um, but actually in Europe, where the tech sector perhaps is a little bit smaller, the spread between the best and the worst sector wasn't materially different um, from what we've seen in, in, in previous years. And then finally, uh, you know, we think inflation is an important question, um, certainly given the amount of, of, of stimulus from, from, from governments and from central banks that we've seen. Um, and the chart here really captures uh, long-term inflation expectations for the UK, for the, for the US and for the Eurozone. Um, and really what we see is that, that you know, the um, inflation expectations for the US have, have shifted most dramatically. Um, you know, they, they dropped sharply in, uh, during the, um, the, the early stage of the pandemic, but with the amount of stimulus we've seen and with the, the early signs of recovery, um, we've really seen it, um, you know, with those expectations pick up. Um, and inflation represents um, a, a bit of a challenge for policymakers, uh, potentially, um, because the faster that inflation reaccelerates, the more they will have to decide whether they're prepared to tolerate that um, or, or feel the need to, to act. Uh, our view, um, just, to, just to, be, uh, to be quick and clear, is that we, don't, we think inflation will pick up, but not enough um, over the next year or two to, to force central banks into a decision. Um, we do think that central banks will be prepared to tolerate inflation rates that were maybe a little bit higher um, than we've seen in the past, certainly in developed markets. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's an important thing to monitor but currently it's not something that is, is, is concerning us too much. Um, let me talk briefly about the, the, the money farm investment process. Um, and what you see here is that we think in terms of, um, you know, the risk profile of our customers and marry that to uh, an investment process and a, and a, and a process of portfolio construction um, and ETF selection. And if you look on the right hand, the right hand side, what you or the, the, uh, the middle, you'll see the strategic asset allocation, which is an annual process that we go through that really um, asks us to, to take a step back and think about the long term, think about expectations for the next 10 years, um, to try and understand how asset classes um, might develop, to think about starting valuations, to think about you know, macroeconomic drivers. Um, and put that in a, in a much broader and longer term context than the sort of tactical asset allocation that we do, you know, every every quarter, every every month, um, and and over the you know the shorter time periods. Um, and so, with that, let's talk about long term expectations. And 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 we start, um, you know, in terms of GDP and 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 um, and inflation. Um, and what you see here are some expectations. Um, from, from the IMF about um, 2021 and, and the medium term trend. Um, and the chart looks, you know, the two charts taken together look fairly optimistic. Uh, the expectation here is that economic growth in the next five years will be stronger than in the last five years across most, most of the global economy. Um, whereas inflation will remain relatively subdued um, and in line. Now, given where, um, we talk about this in more detail, but given where unemployment rates are and, you know, the slack in the labor market that we see today, that doesn't seem like a, um, you know, a, a, a crazy set of assumptions. But from a long term perspective, it, it's, you know, it's an optimistic view um, for, uh, for the global economy and, you know, over the long term for, for, um, for risky assets. Um, so what does that do when we think about the, um, the long-term expected returns, the 10-year expected returns? And this is the, um, the output 
of our um, of our latest strategic asset allocation process that we we performed in in, in late 2020. Um, a few things to highlight. The first on the left hand side, you see very low expected return for government bonds. Um, and perhaps given where starting yields are that that shouldn't come as as a great surprise. Um, if you look on the right hand side, um, and we've broken it out this year, which we haven't done in the past, you'll see a differentiation between US and non US equities. Um, and the, um, you know, the, the, the model, and this is a fairly mechanical process. Um, you know, the expectation here is that there is better upside in, in non US equities than in, in, in the US. Um, remember, the key drivers here are very much, you know, macroeconomic growth expectations and starting valuation. Um, these, you know, over a tactical time frame, these aren't the only things that can drive, um, can drive financial markets, not by any means. Um, but this is a, you know, this is the, the, the long term process that we follow and, 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 you know, given the starting valuations and given the growth expectations, um, you know, the, the result is that, that, that the uh, non US developed markets look, look rather better value than, than the US does. Um, overall, you know, we can say that that uh, expected returns um, are perhaps a little bit lower than we've seen in previous years, particularly on the on the fixed income side. Um, but that you can can still we think you can still construct construct um, interesting interesting portfolios uh, portfolios with with decent expected returns um, with the um, with with the the asset classes that the liquid asset classes that we see today. Now let's um, turn briefly to uh, 2021. Um, and what we see here is, um, you know, just a, a set of leading indicators, some aggregate leading indicators. Uh, this is monthly data uh, for a range of um, for a range of, 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 of economies. And it really looks at two things, you know, whether the economic activity is is above or below the long term trend and whether it's improving or, or deteriorating. And, and it captures a picture of the snapshot of the world today. And what it says is that, that you know, the recovery in Asia, is, in Asia rather, is, is, is ahead of the, the pace. Um, you know, growth is above the long-term trend and improving. Uh, in the US and, and the large European um, economies, it's still below the long-term trend, but it's improving. And the UK, for various reasons, um, still seems to be a little below the long-term trend. And, and we haven't yet begun to see um, the recovery and the benefits of some of the strong vaccine rollout um, that we would uh, expect to see and hope to see uh, going forward. Um, you know, just to, to sort of capture the point, you know, there are, um, you know, growth is expected to pick up. Um, that is what we, we, we continue to see in the, in, the, um, in the weekly and monthly data. Um, but it's an important assumption that we continue to need to validate, um, you know, and, and, and how well you know, how strong the recovery is, how broad based the recovery is will become increasingly important um, as, the, as the year goes on, not just for 2021, but also for the sustainability of the economic recovery um, in 22 and beyond. The key part of this inevitably is, is, um, is, is the vaccine rollout. Um, this is a chart from, from something called the Good Judgment Project. Uh, it's publicly available um, and it's based on um, on, on the output of a, of a book called Super Forecasting, which some of you may have, have, have heard of. And, and, and what it really does is it, it asks a set of forecasters um, the same question over and over again um, and tracks how their views change. Um, and what it basically is, is saying here is that the expectations for when a vaccine rollout would, would occur in the US in this case, um, those expectations have been steadily brought forward over the last few weeks. Um, and that's something that, that we would argue, I think everyone would argue is, is a broad based positive, uh, certainly for the US economy and, and, and to the extent that we see that reflected elsewhere for the, for the global economy as well. Um, the question is, is not just about the macro, but, but also for, um, um, you know, for, for equities and for, for, for businesses. Um, and there's really two parts to it. The, the one is, you know, will we see stronger growth this year than last year? Yes. Um, and the second is, will we see those expectations improve over the course of the year? So it's not a heroic assumption to think that you'll see better earnings in, in 2021 than in 2020 for a lot of companies. 
um, but are those expectations too low or too high? And so the, the, you know, this, the most important line on this chart is on the right hand side, it's the line going, going up gently, um, which is the 2021 expectations. And the message there is that, that you know, analysts had a robust view about the state of, of, of this year, um, but those expectations in the US um, are, are actually improving as time has gone on, as, as companies are reporting and, and as you know, management teams are giving indications about the relative strength of, of their businesses. We see a similar picture um, on the, uh, you know, for the Eurozone. Um, and if we, we put up the UK here as well for the FTSE 100, again, you would see a, a, a similar pattern. Um, so the underlying, you know, uh, fundamentals of, of the economy appear to be improving and they appear to be being reflected in the expectations that we have um, for companies on, on a global basis. Um, so where we end up here is, is, is a 2021 that we think is, is, is shaping up reasonably well so far. Obviously, there's a lot of considerations around um, you know, the vaccine rollout, around the, the risks of mutations and variants, um, about the handover from government uh, support to, um, you know, to a self-sustaining private sector recovery. Um, but the underlying, the underlying fundamentals um, gradually look to be improving. Uh, and that's a that's a good start. Um, so with that, let me make um, just a few concluding comments. Um, you know, we were uh, we were talking about this this quote from from Lenin, um, who apparently said that there are decades where nothing happens and weeks where 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 decades happen. Um, and certainly, we think back to twenty twenty, there were definitely weeks when that's how it how it felt. Um, you know the you know the, the scenarios we were faced with were were things that no one had seen before. The range of outcomes was extremely broad, um, and so we're trying to understand you know to what extent you know these you know the events of last year will be reflected and really have an impact going forward. Um, and our starting thought, our current thinking, is that the 2020 and the pandemic will prove to be an accelerant for for trends that that you could already have identified digitalization, sustainability, the rise of China. Um, you know, uh, these are things that, that, that were well, you know, well identified before, before uh, the pandemic and, and seem to have gathered even more momentum. You know, the outcomes, however, are not entirely clear. There are obviously some very positive opportunities, um, you know, but it's not a guarantee that that's where we'll end up. You know, will we see greater global cooperation? Will we see greater nationalism? Um, will that have implications for, uh, for, for, for the shape of supply chains? You saw the newspaper today, the, the US administration is, is reviewing supply chains in the wake of the pandemic to, to focus on its national security. You know, this has a set of implications potentially for profit pools, for um, companies. Some will be winners, some will be losers. All of these are, are considerations that we need to, you know, that we need to think about. Um, but overall, what you what you 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 see here, what we what we think is that there is there's there's real potential um, for this disruption that we're seeing uh, in the global economy to translate into something that's 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 positive that can be reflected in in um, you know in in improving equality, but also from from our financial markets perspective in in a greater opportunity set going forward. Um, there are no guarantees. Um, those opportunities still need to be grasped, but from our perspective, they're very clearly there. So thank you very much. Uh, let me turn it back to Ilona um, and um, look forward to taking any questions. Um, thank you for a learning quote, Richard. <laughs> Um, and well, that was quite fast paced. Um, so do rest assured, we will share the strategic asset allocation document with you by email and it will also be available online. So everything in more detail will be there. So you have the, the time to read through and understand it better. Um, also, um, just to remind you, the investment consultants are live, but if you're struggling to connect uh, with them and get them chatting with you, um, do book an appointment online, so um, so they are available um, for for appointments. Um, and now over to Ross, um, head of product, for a little bit of live demo. Um, over to you, Ross.
Thank you, Elena. Um, so yes, uh, tonight from from my side, we're going to I'm going to share briefly um, or give you some insight into the principles that we're using to prioritize um, uh, our product development, uh, and then go into a, a hands-on demo of roughly ten features that we've we've added over the last six months or so. So uh, for, in terms of principles, uh, there, there are three things that, that uh, we prioritize above, above all else. Um, the idea of, of, of a hybrid solution, human and digital, um, it's, it's something that sits at the core of our, our value proposition. Um, and in, in terms of the way that we, we build our digital experience, we're always looking for ways to bring the human side of our business uh, to, the, to the forefront and to make sure that uh, you know that there is a team of uh, investment consultants um, uh, people at managing your portfolios like like Richard and, and, and his team um, and to and to give you access to those those people um, via a medium that 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 works for you uh, in terms of simplicity there's, there's there's two angles to this the, the first is money farm um, or, or is firmly in the the scale-up phase now um, it has a 10-year history since it, it, it was first founded um, and along the way you acquire uh, you acquire a few uh, products and features that, that that don't work out as planned um, and it's necessary to to take stock of that and to uh, ensure that you're getting rid of the things that that, that don't form part of your long term uh, view, so that you're able to build new features, new products uh, as quickly and as easily as possible. And then, secondly, wealth management as a as a domain is is particularly complicated, um, and we want to ensure that we abstract away as much of that complexity from from you, our customer, um, so and, and that we take the, the the burden of that complexity so that that we can do um, most, if not all of the job job for you in terms of managing your money. And then finally, uh, mobile first. Uh, that, that This doesn't mean mobile only. Uh, mobile first uh, to us means um, that everything we do, everything we think about, um, the designs of our, our, our applications are, are thought of in a mobile context. Um, so will they fit on the real estate of a, of a mobile device? Um, and then it's easier to scale that up to, to our, our web applications. Um, it, it also means the way we we choose to or the the, the channels that we provide um, uh, to you to to get in contact with us. We're, we're prioritizing those that are um, uh, easily accessible via via mobile. How do, how do we know that we're on the right track? Um, well, this is from a couple of days days ago, um, and and thank you, Dominic, for 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 this kind review. If if you're on the call tonight or, or watching after the fact. Um, the, the title says it all, perfect balance of human robot investment um, uh, plus access to a knowledgeable advisor uh, if, if, if needed. Uh, we take, take customer, customer feedback to heart. Um, the, the entire company has, has access to, to feedback in, in a real-time in a real-time manner. Um, and anything that, that isn't up to, up to standard gets, gets responded to very quickly. Um, so this, this really has become a pulse for, for uh, the company, if, if you like. Uh, in, in terms of uh, new features that we've added, the first two, just for the, the, the sake of time, I'm going to show you, show you some slides and then we'll switch across to, to a live demo. Uh, so for those uh, who have not yet signed up to Money Farm and are considering it, um, one of the gaps that we, that we found was uh, cust potential customers who are downloading our app directly from the App Store or Play Store, um, maybe through a referral from uh, family or friends. Uh, and they weren't, they weren't able to quickly understand what our value proposition is. So we've added a series of, of, of screens um, that before you uh, sign up for our service, we give you a, a very quick uh, overview of, of what it is that we do. Um, and it's, it's just enough information to, uh, to, to decide whether or not this is something for, for, for you. Uh, the second feature, which is also applicable to uh, new users who are signing up, is the real-time identity verification. Uh, here we've, we've integrated with um, a third party called Unfido. And this allows us to check the identity of our, our customers in, in order to remain compliant with the uh, KYC um, regulations um, in, in a real-time manner. So if you're signing up uh, late evening or uh, over a weekend, um, for the majority of users, we no longer have to, to wait for a, a working day for, for someone to check that, those identity documents. Um, we were, were able to verify that it is a legitimate uh, user signing up and, and activate their account. Uh, this just gives you a very, very quick um, view of, of steps that, that, in, that, that you take to, to sign up and to verify your, your identity. Um, but at this point, I will switch across to a live demo 
uh, which always makes it a little bit more interesting. Um, and the first feature that I would like to show you is uh, two-factor authentication. Um, it was by popular demand um, and uh, admittedly something that, that we were, were probably missing for some time was the ability to add another layer of security to your account. So in the event that uh, your credentials become compromised for, for whatever reason, uh, you have another, another fallback um, to, to make sure that your account remains secure. So if I'm, I'm a customer signing in to my account via the web app, uh, I have my mobile app available here and I get a notification that pops up that says, uh, would you like to allow or deny a login request? Um, obviously, if it's me logging in, I can approve it. If it's not me logging in, then I know that something is, is not right and I can deny access. So in this case, I will allow access and it'll allow me to allow me to log in. There are multiple ways to, to solve the uh, two-factor authentication challenge. We've decided to use our mobile app as the second factor authentication, which makes the user experience as, as easily, easy and seamless as, as it possibly can be. Uh, there's no need to enter any code or, um, uh, uh, or, or anything like that. Um, while, while that logs in, uh, I'll, I'll continue on the mobile device. So the next thing that I'd like to show you is uh, the build out your financial plan feature. Uh, so what we found was, was customers who had, um, uh, who had signed up for, uh, and start, got uh, started their investment journey with a particular type of investment, say uh, an ISA or a, or, or a pension. Um, they weren't, weren't uh, readily aware of the other um, types of investments that they could, could open with Money Farm. So what we've done here is we've, we've made it very clear and obvious what, what else you can do um, once you've become a, a Money Farm customer. And we give you a brief overview of uh, each of the account, account types and uh, the, ben the benefits of, of opening up those, those, those accounts. Um, what you'll also notice here is that even though I have an ISA on this particular account, we're still showing uh, the, the option to, to open up a new ISA. And that's an, another feature that we've added, um, again, uh, uh, popular demand from, from customers, is the ability to split your ISA allowance across, across multiple portfolios. Um, so you can now go ahead and, and open a, a second ISA portfolio if you so, so choose to do so. Um, that's that's quite popular if uh, you want to create a portfolio for uh, uh, two of your children or, or something along along those lines. Um, the next one is the ability to to book a call, um, and I'll, I'll pick this one up on the on the web app. Uh, here you have the option to select a a time slot um, and a, a date on which you want to uh, speak to one of the investment consultants. Um, this is particularly useful if you, yeah, ahead of ahead of time want to want to book a time to, to speak to a consultant. You can enter, uh, yeah, you can see the availability of the consultants, and you can choose to uh, choose choose to uh, book a call. Um, let's just start that again because it's taking a little bit long. I am using a test version of our, our app here, so bear with me if it takes a little bit longer than it would would normally. Um, the next feature that I'll show you is ongoing suitability. This is something that used to be uh, in a separate, uh, separate part of our application called the Advice Center. We've now fully integrated that into our application. Um, and on the dashboard, you'll see the option to uh, review um, the recommendation for a particular portfolio if we think something has, has changed in your personal circumstances. Um, the most common example of that is if you started out your portfolio with a 10 year time horizon, say, and three or four years have now passed, uh, the time horizon left on that portfolio is reduced to, to five or six years. Um, and, and therefore, we think that you might be uh, better suited to a lower or a lower risk portfolio in that, in that, connect, in that case. Uh, you can tap on your review recommendation and you can uh, choose to change the, the time horizon. And you can also change, uh, choose to change the, the portfolio level that, um, that, that you're invested in. Uh, we, we tell you or we give you uh, our uh, opinion on whether or not that portfolio is is uh, just right for you or whether it is uh, appropriate. Um, the next feature that I'd like to show you is the recurring investment plan. So one, one of the things that customers uh, like to do is deposit a lump sum of cash. In this case, this customer has 50,000 pounds sitting in, in available cash. Um, and 
they don't want to expose it to the market immediately all in one go. So what we've done here, um, and this card, by tapping this card, it, it, it tells you the story. Um, we've, we've given you the ability to drip feed, so to speak, a, a lump sum of money into a portfolio of your choice over a, a period of time. Um, so quickly tapping through the story, it gives us a breakdown of, of why uh, drip feeding your funds into a portfolio might be a, a good idea. And at the end, you're able to set up a recurring investment plan. Um, I can choose to put it into my ISA portfolio and I'll then get the option of uh, one off or monthly. In this case, we'll go with, with monthly and confirm that. This just, and the amount that we want to put in on a monthly basis, let's go with 5,000. So that sets up a, a, a recurring investment. Each month on the first of the month, we'll move 5,000 pounds from available cash into the portfolio of your choice. In this case, it's uh, ISA. Uh, and the next, the next uh, update that I would like to share is uh, a revamp of the funding details. Um, this is uh, if we tap across to our profile and I go into funding details, you'll see that we've, we've broken this up into the, the various type of, of funding details, your recurring contributions, bank accounts, transfers and withdrawals uh, to show you the recurring contributions, one of which I just set up. Um, we've got the 5,000 pounds being moved into from available cash into the ISA portfolio on the first of every month. Um, and by way of example, we've also got the transfers, which show you a list of any transfers that uh, you've set up. Uh, when I talk about transfers, I'm referring to an ISA or a, a pension transfer from another provider um, into, your, into your money farm account. And then uh, finally, uh, the last feature that I would like to show you is going to be uh, on our live app. So I'm going to remove our test app. I'm going to open up a live app. Um, and I'm going to show you our PSD2 or open banking integration, which is a new channel or a new way of adding money to your account. Um, in this case, I've enabled private mode. So all the, uh, the numbers or portfolio values are, are um, blurred out. Uh, this is pretty useful for the sake of a demo, or if you want to uh, show family or friends uh, the app without, without them seeing specific details. Uh, in this case, I'm going to head to add funds, hit top up, uh, I'm going to choose the portfolio that I would like to add money to. I'm going to choose the ISA P7. Um, at this point, we dynamically check. Uh, well, firstly, we show you the bank accounts from which you want to fund. In this case, I'm going to choose a, a Revolut account. And at this point, we, we dynamically check uh, the, the methods that are available for that given bank account. Uh, in this case, we're recommending easy bank transfer, which is built on top of open banking. Um, uh, because based on our previous experience with customers using this, this channel for adding funds, it's been one of the most successful ways to, to add funds. So let's go ahead and, and, and try do a, an open banking transfer. Uh, we'll make it a one-off and we'll just select a trivial amount of, of a pound. Click confirm. At this point, we recap the, the details of the transfer that we're setting up and we tell you that we're gonna switch you across to your bank to authorize the payment. So if I say confirm easy transfer, should open up my uh, Revolut app, which I have installed on this, this device and checks face ID. And what it does is it all the details of the payment are uh, already available. You don't have to insert anything like the account number, the beneficiary name, um, uh, any kind of reference. It's all been pulled through automatically. And all you have to do is tap, tap authorize. Authorizing the payment lets it go off immediately and switches you back to the uh, Money Farm app. And in the Money Farm app, we should get confirmation that the payment has, has been successfully requested. Um, in reality, that's, that, that payment would have been done via a faster payment and it should be sitting in, uh, in Money Farm's client money account and will be added to your portfolio on the next business day. And that is a very quick uh, overview of roughly 10 features that we've added to our, our app recently. Um, I'll hand it back to Lona and happy to take happy to take questions. Um, thank you, Ross. Um, it, it does amaze me how much the, the app and platform has changed in the last 18 months. So uh, kudos to you. Um, and now probably the 
the part I've been looking forward to the most, um, where I get to ask questions to, to Richard and Ross. Um, some have been inspired by um, what you've, you've been asking already, but, um, but see, see if you find some of the answers interesting. So Richard, um, let's get you um, up here with us. Sorry, I was, I was just answering a question. Um, go for it. <laughs> busy interacting with the, with the clients. Thank you for keeping Richard busy. But um, let's start with you actually, Richard. As we're finding ourselves all dialed in from, from, from home, um, showcasing our bookshelves. Um, if when, when the COVID, if COVID um, successfully transitions with the vaccines and, um, and the right policies, um, and we are out of, um, out of lockdowns, out of, out of the crisis, um, who do you think will be the biggest winners in 2021? And most importantly, the losers. Yeah. So, so um, you know, I think, um, you know, we talked uh, earlier about the idea of, 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 of the pandemic and um, being, being an accelerant. Um, and if that's, if that's right, then, then, you know, some of those trends that we've seen um, really pick up, it seems reasonable to think that, um, um, that, that they will continue to, to, to win. And so the, the digitalization trend that we see um, you know, we think will 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 continue. Um, now, there's, that's different from saying that that you know that means that that you know those stocks will do really well because because again you know some of those expectations clearly have already been um, been reflected in 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 some of those share prices. Um, but as a trend, that's that seems to make sense. Um, similarly, the you know the 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 relative performance of, uh, at a, on a global level of of, of China um, suggests that that you know that that, that China will will come out of this in in in, in stronger shape um, relatively than 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 some other some other countries and and there are a set of implications that that that, that, that go along with that um, you know I think that that you know the, the question which we we brought up um, recent previously about about supply chains is an important one um, you know I think that the, we've obviously had a, a very efficient global supply chain. Um, over the last, that's developed over the last few years, and 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 the uh, and 2020 highlighted some of the um, uh, some of the fragility there, and and you can imagine that the governments will will um, you know look and, and and see as to whether the the length of those global supply chains is too long for their for their for the security of of food of medicine. Um, so you know you could even you know ironically think about a a, um, a world in which in which domestic manufacturing broadly defined um, is, a, is a relative beneficiary, um, perhaps at the expense of, of, of higher costs even. Um, and then there's the question of, of sustainability, which is a question I answered on the chat. Um, you, know, you, know, there, you know, one of the interesting things about, about the pandemic is that, that it, it, did, it did highlight um, issues of sustainability. And, and we think that those are trends that, will, um, that are here to stay. Um, and we'll think about ways to, to capture that um, uh, in the in the portfolios or in portfolios uh, going forward, um, you know, there's always a question right about about commodities in that context, and 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 we were toying with one idea. The irony of of, of 2021 may be that actually, you know, you do see this trend towards um, towards sustainability, but but in fact, you see a very sharp recovery in in commodity prices as well, and and so, you know, could you see both of those kind of segments do relatively well at least this year? Um, so those are a few thoughts, um, but obviously there's a, there's a, there's an awful lot to cover, and 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 you know a, a strong theme may not always necessarily translate into a, to great financial returns. Great, thank you. So the other side of, of the pandemic for, for you, Ross, has been the the kind of the the push towards digital wealth management and just generally digital services, um, and it kind of it, it facilitated that adoption. Um, so what excites you the most from the product development point of view um, when you think of what the pandemic has facilitated? Uh, yeah, um, I think uh, one, one of the things that we've, we've all become more accustomed to um, through the response to the, the pandemic is, uh, is, is video calls such as this, um, what welcoming um, potentially strangers in, into our homes. Um, and uh, given, given the nature of, of our of our offering and the fact that we do have the, the human side to business, the, the prospect of, of uh, 
allowing our customers to connect with our investment consultants via via video, perhaps uh, embedded within within our apps, is, is something that that is particularly interesting and um, uh, something that we, we may may look at doing. Um, I think one of the other things that that has been uh, particularly uh, uh, noticeable in response to the pandemic is the interest in in our uh, in our service, um, our products and services to to other to other uh, banks and fintechs. Um, we've we've over the last eighteen months we've been developing out a uh, uh, an API to expose our capabilities to to third parties, and the, the interest has, has has definitely spiked um, in in the potential of partnering with us. Um, and that, that's going to build on top of our uh, existing partnership that we have with Post Italiana in, in, uh, in, in Italy. Um, we're, we're actively working on, on integration with, with another big fintech um, and uh, in, in discussions with, with others. So I, I just, that, that's been particularly interesting and as exciting going forward is exposing our, our services to a, a broader base via, via other channels. Interesting. That actually kind of made me wonder. So um, the, the listeners do, uh, um, do add in, in the Q&A whether you've experienced the sort of the same push you've signed up to to any of the, of the new banks or any of the other digital services that you've never thought um, of before, um, just, to, uh, just to let us know um, what you're signed up for and who maybe we should explore as, as a potential partner. Um, Richard, um, over, over to you again. Um, as a marketer, I'm finding myself a little overwhelmed recently with the, with the kind of the abundance of, of, of media um, out there. I mean, not only do we have to deal with, um, with like the normal news sites and, and established media, there's also Reddit boards that um, impact the markets um, and TikTokers telling us how to invest. Um, as, as your most exciting part of your job is to actually be um, on top of the news agenda. Um, what would you recommend to us? To like, what what should we listen to? What do you listen to in your day? Um, so, so I, I, you know, what do what do we uh, what do we do? Look, I, I mean, I think that there's, um, you know, it, there is an awful lot of great content um, around, um, and we, um, you know, we we obviously try and produce great content ourselves, but but we, you know, so we, we you sort of look at it from a you know, um, with, with with quite an interested eye. Um, you know, the first thing is to understand from a uh, from a portfolio perspective what it is that we're trying to do, and and more importantly, what we're not trying to do. So, you know, we are, you know, all the things that you've you've heard. We are long term. We are, you know, broadly diversified. We are focused on asset classes rather than individual securities. We're not trading actively, um, and so you know, in the interest that you have a finite amount of time you you want to kind of we, you know we want to focus our attention on the things that 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 will help us with those decisions most of all um so so you know we we are fortunate enough to have obviously access to a lot of data um and we do our best to have that drive you know drive drive our decisions or at least drive our debates um and we try to focus on 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 the longer term and, and on broader themes uh, rather than individual securities, I think um, you know, and 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 our answer, my answer would be very different if if we had a different sort of set of investing parameters. So you know, I, I will confess, I don't I don't spend a lot of time on Reddit, um, but I think if I was a you know a very active active trader, um, if we were running a, a you know an aggressive trading trading portfolio, then then that is something that we would be paying attention to, um, because we've clearly seen in the last few weeks. Um, you know the impact that, that that can have on individual securities. Now that's that's simply not where we're where, where we're spending our time. So we are in that sense, um, you know, looking at aggregates, um, but also not just looking at traditional data, but but trying to find ways of of incorporating, you know, a lot of new data, uh, so-called alternative data sources, but really new data sources to capture economic activity, to capture sentiment, to try and capture trends. Um, and reflect that in, in in the portfolios, but but again, the key thing for us is to make sure that the, you know, that the information that we're getting is information that that's consistent with the way that we're managing um, our our clients' money, um, because as you say, there's an awful lot of data around, and, and some of it might be relevant to to other people, but would just be noise in the context of of, of how we we look after our clients' money. So avoid the noise is the message. Hmm. Good. <laughs> 
Ross, um, 2020 for me was, was kind of the year where we really, really listened to, to our customers. Um, and like you said earlier, most of those features that you demoed um, were the result of, um, of talking with customers and spending time with them. Um, can you like tell us a little bit more about what's happening in 2021 as a result of this? What can you reveal? Yeah, sure. Uh, so yeah, as, as I mentioned, uh, we, we, we definitely, um, above all else, have, have prioritized customer feedback in, um, in our prioritization process. Um, and I, I recall at this event, uh, roughly around the same time last year, having a discussion with, with two or three people in the, in the foyer after, after the presentation. And I heard from all three of them, uh, I would like support for uh, splitting my, my ISA allowance across multiple portfolios. And uh, today, you know, you, you have that feature and it's, it's uh, not just that conversation, but that conversation and, and others that, that led to that. Uh, in terms of 2021, I think the, the 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 biggest topic, the most notable topic, is is ESG. Um, we're we're spending a lot of time um, on on that at the moment, um, from a product development point of view, from an asset allocation point of view, um, and yeah, uh, as, as as soon as something's available, um, if if anyone is is interested in, in in early access or early preview, just reach out to your investment consultant. To be very happy to to put you in the early beta um, of of that offering. Um, yeah, that's the, the most exciting thing uh, in the next next few months. That is quite a reveal. So um, those those who are listening, do do book an appointment, find out more, send us an email. Um, let's 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 use the opportunity to um, to test something that's that's not enough there yet. Um, the final question for me, um, and and the reason why we're having this discussion is that actually inside Money Farm, you're known as the people who know things before they happen and you kind of sense trends before they go mainstream. And that's kind of the value you bring to the business. So what do you think is the kind of the next big thing that you want to bring into your, your roles and how you, um, um, how you exist at Money Farm in, in the coming months? Is that to me? I'll take yeah. it first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, th I think the, the next, the next, uh, uh, tier of of evolution, if if you like, is 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 probably going to be um, int introducing some more sophisticated technologies to to improve our customer experience. Um, we've we we already have the idea of of tailoring an experience, uh, tailoring our experience based on geographic region. Um, but we we know that even within the region, we, there's there's different profiles of of, of customers. Um, and with employing the right the right kind of technology, we can tailor our we can go a step further and tailor our experience uh, to a specific customer. So I think, yeah, in, in terms of a slightly long longer term trend, um, giving a more customized uh, experience based on uh, who, who we're dealing with, um, uh, that's that's probably something that'll, uh, that'll that'll be interesting and exciting. Richard, what would you add to that? No, I'm, I'm fortunately I'm going to have to agree with Ross. I, I, you know, I think I think that the you know um, the the customization question is 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 a very interesting one and, and one that we've we've you know been been spending some time on already um, in terms of building building tools that that um, that somebody could use to to you know to to add their own flavor to a portfolio but to do it in a way that that we think is is you know that we can almost provide uh you know risk management for say yes this is a you know this is a portfolio this is potentially what it would look like this is how it would have behaved um and and you know sort of add potentially add value to a to a customer from a risk management perspective um again that's that's you know that's there's a there's a number of steps to uh you know to, to go through before before that sees uh you know that get, gets put in front of a of a customer but it's it's you know something that we are, are you know that we're we're thinking about that we're, we're we're trying to think how it would work and 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 would it be would it be a good idea would would would, would customers like it should they like it um these sorts of questions but that that question of customization you know across the you know the customer experience is is something that we uh, that, that we've been thinking about Oh, watch this space. Well, viewers, um, if you'd like anything customized, <laughs> let us know and we'll, we'll explore this internally. So that concludes the, the, the interview um, part of, of the session. And in fact, it mostly 
concludes our event. So I'll um, I'll um, leave the, the closing notes to, to Giovanni Dapra, our chief executive. Um, and thank you for, for listening. Can you hear me better now? Yes, yes. you're back. Okay. You might need to repeat. Okay, sorry, 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 everybody. So basically, I was saying that we are aware. Thanks again for coming. I was busy answering question, and uh, and it's very great to to have uh, um, all of you here and uh, engaging with you directly, which sometimes is, is quite hard. Particularly, it has been hard during the last year. Uh, we have a lot of opportunity for 2021. Uh, we do hope that some of the features and and uh, and, and question you, you raised we can we can fulfill. Um, but I do believe that really, if anything, we should uh, uh, close 2020 with, with uh, uh, a couple of key learning, particularly on the, the value of remaining invested, which we think it's really something that uh, a lot of us tend to underestimate uh, as probably one of the most important factors for long-term uh, success uh, in, in financial markets. Um, ultimately, I would just like to say that tomorrow is going to be our first day in in, uh, in television in the UK, and Ilona, the team has a great job in in, uh, in pushing our brand forward. Uh, and uh, as uh, uh, as we mentioned, uh, please uh, do expect some news on the on the ESG front. Uh, so uh, allowing portfolio for uh, for a different tilt towards sustainability, which is something we we believe quite strongly. And uh, a lot of other, uh, I would say, uh, product improvement in 2021. So thanks a lot to everybody for participating again. Please do reach out and we hope to uh, talk to you uh, soon. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, do stay on for a few seconds. We'll ask you how the event went. Please let us know so we can do better next time. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you.